Advent. We've heard the word a dozen times today. It comes from a Latin word, Adventus, which simply means coming. And during the season of Advent, more than at any other time of the year, we focus on the coming of Jesus, and more accurately, on the comings of Jesus. On His coming into the world through the womb of a virgin, and on His coming again when He brings with Him a new heaven and a new earth. Now, in most of the churches that intentionally focus on the season of Advent, it is the tradition on the second Sunday of Advent to read from the prophet Isaiah. That's because no prophet spoke of the coming one more than Isaiah. And so I have chosen as our text this morning, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. If you have grown up in the church, you know the text very well. The text is printed, at least in part, on many Christmas cards. It might interest you to know that up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, it was illegal to read this text in the pulpits of the churches of Eastern Europe under the reign of the Soviet Union. Thanks to the musical composer George Frederick Handel, who in 1741 set the text to music in his now famous Messiah, Nearly everyone in the westernized world has heard the pivotal verse of the text, whether they know it was from Isaiah or not. The pivotal verse, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, even as I spoke the words, many of you began to sing them in your head. For Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto us a son is given, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto us a son is given, and the government... Stop right there. (laughs) Now... As we sing songs like that, do we actually hear what we're singing? Do we really hear? For unto us a child is born. For unto us. For. Handel was a careful student of the scriptures. And so he realized that the key word of the pivotal text of Isaiah 9 is the conjunction for. For unto us a child, for unto us a son. The question is then, what is the for therefore? Now, maybe a clearer way to render the Hebrew word that Isaiah uses is because. Because unto us. Because unto us a child is born. Because unto us a son is given. What is the because therefore? What is the because doing there? Well, let us read the whole text. Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. Hear the word of God. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and fuel for the fire. For... To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of Yahweh Almighty will accomplish this. Spirit of the living God, we believe that you came upon the prophet Isaiah long ago and you enabled him to write down this great vision. And I pray now in your mercy and grace as we make our way through this vision that it will come alive in us as never before. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Whenever we read from the text of the biblical prophets, we need to remember that the words were first spoken to a particular people at a particular time in a particular place for a particular person, purpose. Yes, it turns out that Isaiah was prophesying an event that would take place centuries after he spoke, the event we celebrate on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But when he first spoke the words, he was speaking to a particular group of people in a particular geographical location at a particular moment in history for a particular purpose. Isaiah was speaking these words that Handel made famous in the Messiah to people who were afraid, very afraid to people who are not only anxious about what go, what's going on in the world as we are, Isaiah spoke to people who had very good reasons, objective reasons to be afraid, very afraid. He was speaking to people whose world was literally collapsing. It was during the 8th century before the birth of Christ. Assyria was the dominant political and military power in the Middle East. And Assyria was slowly gobbling up the smaller, less powerful nations around her. In 734 BC, the king of Assyria moved his troops into Palestine. Two years later, he conquered all of Syria and invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, which we now know as Galilee. By 722 BC, Israel was completely destroyed, the 10 tribes scattered into racial oblivion. Even as Isaiah spoke his, because a child is born to us, the Assyrian army was perched at the border of Judea. The people could hear the boots of the trampling soldiers. They could see the garments rolled in blood. Think the pictures of what the Russian army is doing in Ukraine right now. Darkness was descending on Judea. Their souls were being brought low by the thickening gloom. Ever felt that way? Ever felt like it would all engulf you? Ever felt that it would all collapse upon you? I have. I do. The king of Judah was afraid. The people of Judah were afraid. I mean, who were they in comparison to the forces of darkness and destruction at their border? Now, into all of that, the word of the Lord came. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Because Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the commander of the armies of heaven, would do four things. Four things described before the pivotal verse in Isaiah 9. Yahweh would cause light to shine in the darkness. Yahweh would cause joy to spring up in the gloom. Yahweh would break the yoke of oppression. And Yahweh would burn up the instruments of war. Verse 2. Yahweh would cause light to shine in the darkness. Verse 3, Yahweh would cause joy to spring up in the gloom. Verse 4, Yahweh would break the yoke of oppression. Verse 5, Yahweh would burn up the instruments of war. And why would this happen? Because the king of Judah would pull off some clever political maneuver? Because some other super, super power would come on the scene and overcome Assyria? No, it would all happen because... Because a child would be born. Four. Four. For unto us a child will be born. For unto us a son will be given. 
Put yourself in the shoes of Ahaz, king of Judah. This superpower stands at your border, ready to invade. You and the people under your leadership are terribly frightened. And what does God call you to do? To look at your own army for security? To look at another army to come and rescue you? To look at your own ingenuity and technological prowess? No. God calls you to look at a child. This child would be the ground of your hope. Now, any time a child is born, our spirits are lifted. The miracle of birth does something from our, for our souls. A doctor once said to me, every birth is a sign that God has not given up on the world. Isaiah, however, clearly is speaking of a unique birth. A child will be born, a son will be given. Note the verbs, born, given, born, given, born, given. Born suggests the child's real humanity. Given suggests something else. Given by whom? Given suggests the actions beyond that of the parents. Given suggests a special act of the creator. And now here's the major message of Isaiah 9. When this child is born, when this son is given, the four great promises can be fulfilled. Because this child is born, because this son is given, light will shine in the darkness. Joy will spring up in the gloom. The yoke of oppression will be shattered and the instruments of war will be burned up. The question then is, who? Who is this child? Who is this son? About the time that Isaiah prophesied, the wife of Ahaz, king of Judah, gave birth to a man named Hezekiah. Was Hezekiah the child on whose shoulders rested the fulfillment of the promises? If you read about him, you discover that he was a really good man. He was a really good and godly king, but he hardly ushered in the light and joy and freedom and peace of which Isaiah spoke. After Hezekiah came other kings, all less godly than he, some downright ungodly. Then came Josiah, a really, really good and godly king. Was he the child? He did affect massive moral and economic reform, yet he hardly ushered in the kind of light and joy and freedom and peace envisioned in Isaiah 9. Who then is this child, this son? Unless he is born, the promises cannot be fulfilled. None of the kings of Judah even came close to fulfilling the promises. I mean, how could they? Look at the names the child is given. How can any mere mortal live up to what these names embody? Isaiah 9, 6, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. How can any mere human possibly embody the meaning of all those names? Can you imagine giving a child in our time that all five of those names? Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Who could ever live up to that? Wonderful. It's a word that Isaiah uses in many other places, but only of God. It means incomprehensible. It means full of glory. It means supernatural. The child to be born is like God, a wonder, an incomprehensible supernatural wonder. Who is he? Counselor, someone to whom to turn for wisdom, someone who embodies insight and discernment and truth, someone who leads people into the very counsels of the living God, someone who knows God thoroughly and intimately. Who is this? Mighty God. Oh my, it's another term that Isaiah uses a lot in his book, but only of God. No mother in Isaiah's time would have ever called her child mighty God. In Hebrew, it's El Gabor. El, God, Gabor, hero, champion, warrior, strong one. 
Like God, this child possesses great strength, strength to deliver. Who is he? Are we talking about God himself coming to birth in the world? Everlasting Father. Literally, it is Father of Eternity or Father of all futures, source of all life, possessor of eternity. A child will be born. A son will be given. Feel the paradox. The one who begets is begotten. The one who causes children to be born is born. Who is he? Prince of Peace or ruler of shalom. This is the one who ushers in and administers the shalom of God. Shalom, as you know, is more than the absence of war. Shalom is the presence of wholeness. Shalom is the presence of glory. Shalom is the fullness of the kingdom of God. This child's name is Prince of Peace, and he brings peace because he is peace. So who is he? Years passed, decades passed, Centuries passed, then, and you know what I'm going to say now, then it happened. In Bethlehem of Judea, during the time that Caesar Augustus thought he ruled the world, when he thought that the government rested on his shoulders, in a village under occupation by foreign troops, the night sky suddenly filled with angels, an army of angels singing glory to God in the highest. Why? Because the child with all those names has been born. I bring you good news of great joy, says the angel, for unto you is born this day. There's those, the words again from the pivotal verse of Isaiah 9, for unto you. The son with all the names is finally given. Wonderful was born, counselor was born, mighty God was born, father of eternity was born, prince of peace was born. And and what a scene it was, so unexpected and so incongruous. Wonderful, lying in a cattle trough, counselor at the mercy of sinners, mighty God, a helpless infant who can't even feed himself. Father of eternity, now in time, held in the arms of a young virgin. Prince of peace, born into a violent, war-torn part of the world. And do you see what it all means in light of Isaiah 9? Do you understand what it all means? It means that now the promises can be fulfilled. Everything that takes place before the for, everything that comes before the because, can now be realized. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Because the child is born, darkness does not have the last word. Jesus, the light, shines in the darkness. As as the apostle John says, the darkness cannot master the light. A number of years ago, the narrator at our daughter's high school Christmas concert put it so powerfully, never again will there be total darkness. Because the child is born, never again will there be total darkness. Jesus, the light, breaks the spell of darkness. He exposes the lies. He overcomes the illusions. He shines into the suffocating darkness of depression. I know because he's done it for me. Because. Isaiah is not saying that darkness will eventually give way to light. He's not holding before us some automatic evolutionary urge within the cosmos. Left to itself, darkness gets darker. It's because the child is born that light shines in the darkness. It's because Jesus is who he is that darkness can never extinguish the light. Isaiah 9, verse 3. You will multiply the nation. You will increase their gladness. Because the child is born, sorrow does not have the last word. Jesus, the joy, lifts the heaviness of disappointment and despair. His presence pushes away away the weight of gloom and grief. I realize that for many people, this season is a hard season, especially this year, after all that we've experienced the last couple of years. For many people, this season is a 
a time of deep sadness. And I understand why, because it happens to me, ironically. It happens to me. And I encourage you to do what Isaiah calls us to do. Look not at the disappointments. Look not at the broken expectations. Look not at the unmet needs. Look not at the losses. Rather, look at, look to the child. Look at, look to Jesus. Because when we see Jesus in the picture, his joy begins to drive away the gloom. Because. Again, Isaiah is not saying that sorrow will eventually give way to joy. He's not holding before us some automatic evolutionary urge within the cosmos. Left to itself, sorrow often gets worse. It's because the child is born that joy can break into the gloom. It's because Jesus is who he is that he can turn mourning into dancing again. Isaiah 9 verse 4. You will break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. Because this child is born, oppression, be it political, economic, emotional, or spiritual, does not have the last word. Jesus, the mighty God, El Gabor, the divine warrior, shatters yokes. Oh, how we need to hear this in our time. Is not our time marked by bondage? Are we not held captive? Not only to superpowers like Assyria, but to super superpowers like addiction. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because the child is born, bondage does not have the last word. Because the son is given, there's hope for freedom from any form of captivity. Jesus, the strong man, as the Gospels call him. Jesus, the stronger than any superpower, can break the yoke of drugs or alcohol or pornography or materialism. He can break the stronghold of the myth of autonomy. Jesus, the champion, can free us from terrifying memories, from crippling guilt, from bitterness, from self-pity, from poor self-image. He can even free us from the fear of death. He has come to set captives free. Sin and death and darkness lose their grip on us when Jesus enters the picture. Because, again, Isaiah is not saying that bondage will eventually give way to freedom. He's not holding before us some automatic evolutionary urge within the cosmos. Left to itself, addiction kills us. It's because the child is born that the yoke of oppression is broken. It's because Jesus is he is who he is that chains can fall off. Isaiah 9 verse 5. Every boot of the booted warrior will be for burning and fuel for fire. Because this child is born, hostility and strife, hatred and violence do not have the last word. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, makes the instruments of destruction unnecessary. When Jesus walks into the war room, peace finally has a chance. When Jesus walks into a gang-terrorized neighborhood, peace really does have a chance. When Jesus is welcomed in our city, the streets become safe for children and the elderly again. Because... Again, Isaiah is not saying that hostility, hostility eventually dissolves into peace. He's not holding before us some automatic evolutionary urge within the cosmos. Look to the war Russia is imposing on Ukraine. Look to the continued conflict in Syria. Look at the conflict in the inner cities of North America. Look at the conflict in the stratas in which we live. Left to itself, hostility eventually erupts in violence of some sort. It's because the child is born that peace can happen. It's because Jesus is who he is that tanks can be pounded into tractors. Darkness is strong, I know. Jesus, the light is stronger. Sorrow is strong, I know. But Jesus, the joy is stronger. Bondage is strong, I know. But Jesus, our freedom is stronger. Hostility and discord are strong. I know, I know, I know. But Jesus, our peace is stronger still. But someone asks, if the child has been born, then why does darkness still hang over the earth? 
If the son has been given, why has the grip of addiction seemed to increase in our time? Why is there still so much war? Why? Although the answer seems very simplistic, I mean it in all seriousness. The light and joy, the freedom and peace of Jesus the Son are experienced when and where he is allowed in and allowed to work, when the government rests on his shoulders. The darkness and gloom, the bondage and strife of our time do not declare that the child has not come. They declare that the child has not been given access to human hearts and minds. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. What's the next line? Let earth receive her king, and every heart prepare him room. Has earth received her king? Has every heart prepared him room? Has every heart in this room prepared him room? It is when and where the child is allowed in that darkness is pierced by the light, that sorrow is lifted by the joy, that bondage is broken by his victory, and that the instruments of war are diffused by his peace. A wish dream? Pious, naive optimism? No, no, no. This vision is as real as flesh and as blood as the child. The possibilities are as certain as the son. One of the persons I count as a spiritual mentor is E. Stanley Jones, 20th century missionary to India. If you've ever heard me preach before, you've probably heard me mention E. Stanley Jones. I've never met him, but I've read everything he wrote. He always puts things in gospel perspective for me. Jones observes that the early Christians looked out on their world, a frightening world, a collapsing world, and they did not say what many of us say. They did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to. Rather, they said in delight, look what has come to the world. 